Welcome to the Midweek Podcast. This is a time where Wiz and I sit down and we chat about some of the themes and questions of the sermon. This week's uh, topic is on the parable that Jesus tells of the tenants and when they questioned his authority. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Nick, it's uh, one of those interesting parables because it's probably Jesus' most explosive parable. Uh, as he tells it, in the end of it, everyone knows exactly what he means. And we know from the other stories uh, of Jesus telling parables that often when he tells them, sometimes people don't get it and he has to explain it a little bit later. But this one, he is not hiding what he's meaning. Uh, and he plays on very well-known metaphors and he tells the story in a way that they totally get what he's at. And it, and it lands literally like lead, boom. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, they are... Shocked by what he says, but they're also reeling yeah. a little bit in terms of the implications and probably feeling a little bit, probably feeling a little bit embarrassed as they know. And we're talking about the religious leaders here that other people know exactly what he means. And this one is pointed at them. Yeah. Yeah. It's one of those parables that's chilling. Yeah. Uh, for one, because it's a summary of Israel's history. It's kind of like Jesus' pronouncement of how Israel has behaved over the years, Mm -hmm. and then culminates later on in the story. But I think a part of what makes it a chilling parable is that it kind of can apply to the church. And it makes us ask the question of, uh, how would Jesus summarize our history, and and what metaphors would he use? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So your question about what metaphor would Jesus use for the church today um, is a really, really good one. And the metaphor that came to mind for me is the metaphor of a road or a path that you take. And especially for us nowadays when we drive so much, I think that's a metaphor that will really resonate with people. And so, you know, the way Jesus could play with that metaphor today is to say it's almost like you're traveling down a road and you get to the road and there's a fork in the road and you've got these two paths that you've got to, cho- you got to choose. And so you choose to go down the one path, but as you go down that path, you start to become conscious that maybe this is not the right path. And you start feeling really, really uncomfortable about that. And you should have gone the other way. But you still keep going down that path. And so you keep going down, despite the fact that as you go down that path, there are many off-ramps and many opportunities for you to turn off that path and turn back. And you don't. And that probably is not just the story of Israel, but, of, of Israel, but that's also, I think, a, a good metaphor for even the church today. If we look through church history, with various issues and various times, the church has had an opportunity to turn back to correct its path, mm-hmm. but chooses to continue to go down that path. Uh, and, you know, the end is not good. And it reminds me of uh, Shannon and myself and the kids were out in Kelowna last year, and we were going on a, a bike ride out in the mountains, and we were trying to find our way to to the start point and we set the GPS very nicely and off we went and we on this dirt road and it looks good and it looks good and then there literally is this fork and somehow the GPS tells us to go another way and we start driving along that road and become conscious that this just doesn't feel right because the place that we're going to is a pretty well-known place it's a you know it's a big business so you're kind of just expecting that the road would be a little bit more clearly marked but yeah. the gps is telling us keep going in this direction yeah, it's the rail tracks right in Kelowna. It's, Ex- it's supposed to be a nice smooth easy it's ride. a nice smooth <laughs> easy ride and like we're on this thing and the road is getting steeper and it's getting more rough and it turns from just a dirt road into a real four by four track and there's some pretty steep cliffs down the side uh, and we're trusting the GPS, but something internally keeps on saying, nah, this is not right, this doesn't feel right. And luckily for us, about maybe three, four kilometers down that road, uh, rangers start coming down the track, and they like alarmed, like, what are you doing here? You shouldn't be here. No, you guys got to turn back. And so very, very grateful for their uh, just helping us out at that point in time. But, you know, as I reflect on that, that feels very much like the story. There are many opportunities to turn back. You get the sense that this is the wrong thing, but you keep going forward, for some reason or other, believing that you'll get to the same destination. Yeah. Yeah. No, I've had my own fair share of driving and getting lost stories. Uh, But with Israel, we see this repeated pattern of how these are the people of God, and somehow they end up God's enemies. Mm. Mm. And, you know, how is it that it seems like the pattern that we see in the Bible is that the people of faith 
end up not being God's allies, but mm. opposing him. Mm. And I think that also is very, very chilling. It's not just that the people of God are being rebellious, but then turned back, but uh, find themselves in a position where literally they almost become enemies of God. Mm -hmm. you know, and God is really, really angry with them. And so you get examples of you know, things like this chilling parable that we get now. Yeah. You know? So why do we end up there? I, I believe maybe there are two reasons for that, and that is that over time possibly we uh, begin to maybe lose sight of the mission uh, of God as well as the heart of God. You know? And even in the Old Testament, Israel was always meant to be a light to the other nations. You know, a light of God's love and of a different way, but a positive light that was invitational and that really brought others in to come and experience God and in that way be a blessing to the nation. So we know that from the initial call of Abram, that always included that sense that they were called to be a blessing to others. And so when we lose sight of that fact that we are meant to be reaching out, meant to be that blessing to others, and it becomes all about us, you know, we then begin to lose sight of the mission of God. But we also lose sight of the heart of God, uh, that heart of mercy and of love, and we begin to make it all about us. And when we lose sight of those two, I believe, we often do find ourselves in positions where the way in which we are behaving, and even in this case, you know, in the temple, the way in which people are worshipping, and the worship practices actually then become an affront to God and end up working against God's very purposes for calling us and moves us into a state then of being, yeah, we actually starting to actively oppose God, yeah. especially when we get things like the prophets coming and others speaking into us and calling us to correct our behavior and we refuse to. Yeah. Yeah, I think too that, you know, for the church, one of the things that maybe makes us a little different from Israel is that uh, we believe that God's spirit mm. is with us. That's mm. the gift that's been given mm. and guides the church forward. Mm. And, you know, while Israel <laughs> to some degree had God's spirit with them, you know, you see the example in the exile mm -hmm. when God's spirit lifts off the temple and goes mm -hmm. to Babylon. Mm -hmm. And, mm. you know, like that's one of those stories again that's it's a chilling story because you see how serious God takes their sins right and how serious he takes our, our sin, sin. Yeah. yeah um but you know like I think we trust as Anabaptists especially uh you know we see God's guiding hand in our history and so even though we might make missteps we take wrong directions uh, we trust that God's Spirit's the one that's leading us, uh, especially in the, the long, in the long. Um, game here, right? Where we make small mistakes or big mistakes, uh, but there's a correction that comes. Mm. And over time, I feel like God's Spirit's kind of leading us where He wants the mm -hmm. church to go. Mm -hmm. And I think with that view, certainly it allows us to be a little bit more gracious with ourselves in the sense that we don't have to believe that we're going to get every step right along the way. Yeah. You know, um, and I think, again, with, with these stories and the history is listening to those calls. And when you realize you ha there is a misstep, is that sense of course correction. And the church always needs to be open, open to that. Um, and also that sense of listening to the Spirit. And always, I see it as being two challenges for the church when it comes to, um, you know, walking in step with the Spirit. Mm -hmm. I think as Paul would say it, is the one is, yeah, sometimes we are, have a very strong activist orientation and can have a lot of zeal for something which is really good but in actual fact maybe work almost ahead of God and run ahead and so that's why it is important for us always to try and walk in step with the Spirit and so work ahead of God and the Spirit maybe hasn't quite prepared the soil or prepared the situation uh, for God to intervene in the way that God wants us to and so we jump the gun in that sense um, and that's always the danger of those with a very strong activist orientation you know, and the, downside, the other side of that is those who are just sort of super complacent and just happy to let things go on as, as normal. The downside of that is that you can often miss the opportunity when the Spirit is calling you for something and you are lagging behind. Yeah. You know, um, but you're absolutely right to point out that we do have the, the gift of the Spirit guiding us and giving ourselves some grace to be able to say that if we are attentive even to the Spirit's uh, course corrections over time, 
you know, that we do find ourselves heading in the direction that the Lord wants us to. Yeah, I think having a soft enough spirit to be corrected, yeah. right? And to yeah. uh, have a flexible, um, in, uh, <coughs> having a flexible enough theology yeah. so that, you know, we don't get ourselves solidified on one narrow aspect of faith. Because a lot of the time what we try to do is we, we try to boil things down to one point. Uh, it's just our human nature is to simplify things. And so we end up with the theology that's based on just one idea or one aspect of, our, of what the Bible teaches. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then when you're put in a situation where you have to adjust or you know, compensate for how things have changed, you can't. Because mm -hmm. you just mm -hmm. have this frail and rigid theology that just locks you in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, bolting on that as well uh, is a view where, which allows us to say that, you know, our theology might be in a particular point in time, but we've got to be flexible to also learn as we grow, you know. So, as a church, we don't have to have everything figured out in order to head in a particular direction. Um, so, being flexible to be able to say that, hey, um, I might need to expand that or I might need to change that mm -hmm. uh, over time as we, as we learn more things as we go along. So I think that's a really, really helpful one uh, about just not being rigid in that way. Yeah. yeah. Uh, in this story and in the New Testament, in the Gospels, we see that when Jesus talks in public, he's not afraid of taking people to task, uh, denouncing people. Uh, cornering his mm -hmm, opponents mm -hmm, in an mm -hmm, argument. Mm -hmm. Jesus seems pretty aggressive sometimes in his language. Uh, Winston, should we follow his example? <laughs> so Nick, that's a good question. Thank you for throwing that one my way. Um, and so my, my answer is, you know, rather than look at an isolated incident, look at the course of Jesus' ministry. You know, and I think that's a really helpful guide uh, to give us a sense of a better strategy and a better approach. So when we look at Jesus' ministry, we see that he doesn't begin there. You know, he announces the kingdom is breaking in in himself, and then he begins a ministry of teaching, showing or explaining to people what the kingdom's light are, like, how it's different to what maybe they expect, through his miracles showing them what the kingdom breaking in means in people's life, bringing healing and liberty and, and all of that. You know, and the beginning of his ministry and his teaching and all that is really just an invitation for people to both see and to become part of. So it begins in a very invitational approach. But over time, um, his language uh, does become tougher and his challenge becomes much more pointed. And particularly at the religious leaders and those who harden their hearts and harden their stance against him. And so we get to this point where, for example, we have this parable, which is very, very pointed and very, very sharp, and everyone knows exactly what is going on. But this is towards the end of his ministry, and there's been growing resistance to that. So I think we see that there. Um, and so it wouldn't be the place I believe that we start. I think the place that we start is always in an invitational posture, inviting others in uh, to come and experience, to learn, and to grow with us. And at the same time as well, um, you get the impression that Jesus is also very careful of the moment in time when he does this. Mm -hmm. you know, so again, he doesn't do this right at the beginning, even though there are times along the way where he does challenge a pushback against the Pharisees. Here he's actually going into direct confrontation mode. But this is again only towards the end. So he's waiting for the right time in order to do this. So I think timing is is everything and part of growing in wisdom and maturity is also knowing uh, the right time to do something. So you can have zeal and you can even be on the side of the right, but the timing may not be right for a particular action. And so that's how I would explain this. So, yeah. Yeah, I think that's a really fair observation. And, and I think when I think of this question, I also think about what does it mean to be on the other side yeah. of that sort of rebuke. Yeah. And, you know, for myself, I know that most of the time when somebody challenges me or pushes me, in the moment, uh, I don't change. But with time uh, and thinking on what people mm -hmm. say, I, mm -hmm. I sh can shift over. Mm -hmm. And I think biblically, we look at Nicodemus. Mm -hmm. This guy is a religious leader. Mm -hmm. He's a Pharisee. Mm -hmm. And... 
you know, he goes and he talks to Jesus, he doesn't just convert at mm-hmm. that moment. Mm-hmm. You know, Jesus challenges him, mm-hmm. challenges him strongly, mm-hmm. but it takes time for him to change. And you mm-hmm. see by the end mm-hmm. that he's somebody who considers himself a part of a part Jesus'. Of yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I agree with you. That's a totally fair observation. And even if it's not even as something as pointed as conversion, you know, which is that sort of important decision that we need to make. We just look at the disciples. I mean, the Lord taught them, but some things they didn't get immediately, and it took a little bit of time. And so there is often the time for things to to land and to settle and to do, and the Spirit to work in sort of doing its undoing and reshaping work uh, in us and just yeah, allowing the Spirit to move in that way. So even when we are maybe standing up for something uh, and really confronting somebody else, yeah, we might not see that change immediately, but it may come and we've got to trust that the Spirit is at work. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And judging when it's the right time, I think, again, to go back to that idea that we like to reduce things down. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, I should just always be challenging. Mm-hmm. No, 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 no. No. Uh, yeah. You need to judge the situation and make decisions yeah. knowingly. Yeah. And I think sometimes we kind of treat arguments like it's just a war. It's just an all-out war where you get to pull out every weapon <laughs> Every you've weapon got. and you just sling. You just, yeah, <laughs> exactly. You and, go for it. And we got to avoid that sort of posture because you know it just doesn't get you anywhere yeah yeah yeah. that certainly doesn't and anyway talking about this thing about about timing and just reminded me of a story that i read recently about uh, dr martin luther king who was invited to be part of uh, the walk across the bridge in selma and part of that and uh, there was another organization that invited him to join in and initially when he got there, they started and then he withdrew and he said he felt that the timing wasn't right. And people were very, very upset with him as a result of that and felt that that move was actually a retreat. But he actually rather waited until there was a court decision in their favor and then they went ahead. And actually with hindsight, it had much greater impact. You know, so yeah, was he right to protest? Was he right to march? Absolutely. You know, but even he there realized that maybe the timing for this action in this moment wasn't right right now. A little bit later, maybe better. You know, so it, it calls for, I think it calls for wisdom uh, and it calls for tempering that sort of zeal to just go out there you know, and whack the other side and knock him down. Because ultimately you're always wanting to make sure that firstly you walk, you in line and step with the spirit, but you're also using wisdom as to when's the right time to do something. Yeah. Thanks for joining us on this week's podcast. We would like to ask you to kind of engage with what we've been doing. Mm -hmm. We're going to ask two questions. The first one is, can you tell us a story in the comments of a time when you got lost while driving? And the second one is, is how do you personally discern when it's the right time to challenge or to listen? Mm -hmm. You can put that down in the comments and we'll interact with you online uh, after you've watched the podcast. Thanks for joining, and we'll see you next time. Yeah, see you next time.